Coming up next, it's the bookening. But first, a few thoughts about reading. Maybe you're a person who doesn't like to read. Brandon, are you a person who doesn't like to read? No, I love to to read. So you've got yourself a copy of a book and you read it and you're like, yeah. Like, this is great. (laughs) (laughs) You're just really excited to be reading. Okay. But imagine, sir, if you hated to read. Like, if you, you, you were like, I wish I was outside tossing the old pig skin. Yeah. Instead, you were reading. How would you feel then? I would feel like, I wish I was outside tossing the old pig skin. <laughs> Instead of talking about the book I just had to read. <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, you know, an old pig skin. <laughs> I, I ball up into a ball and <laughs> Throw around with my kids. So you're an insane person. <laughs> We've established that Brandon hates reading. He'd rather be outside talking to old pigskin, right, Brandon? That's right. He is yeah. from Texas. Coming up next, <laughs> the book ending reads Pride and Prejudice. Welcome to the Bookening. My name is Nathan Alberson. I'm your humble and obedient host today. This is the Bookening. We don't have a tagline yet. What's our tagline, Jake? Uh, three guys in a really small room talk about books. This is three guys in a really small room talk about books, also known as the Bookening. My name is Nathan Alberson. I'm a guy that talks. I'm the host of the program. I'm joined today by Mr. Jake Menzel. Hi. Yeah. How are you doing? Pastor Jake Menzel. How are you doing today, Jacob? I'm doing well. I'm glad to hear it, sir. Now, what makes you qualified? What makes you the pastor who's a master of reading books? (laughs) Did you plan that one, too? I did. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay. So you're just going on a journey with us. That's right. I'm just here for the ride. All right. Brandon? Hi. Chastine has... As we know. As now. we know. Bre- as we now know. Brandon, what, uh, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the bookening, sir. Good to be here. <laughs> I'm glad to have you. Uh, what makes you qualified to be on the bookening today? One of your friends. Do you, do you want to know more? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Brandon's a, I don't know, he's educated and so is Jake and they know about books and we want to know books better. And we know a lot about books already, especially Brandon because he's got like a PH something. Um, not quite. Not quite. <laughs> but anyway, close. this is The Bookening, brought to you by Warhorn Media. And today we're going to talk about one of the greatest books of all time, Pride and Prejudice. We're going to explore many different facets of the book. We're going to figure out whether it is, in fact, a dreamy, chiclet piece of fantasy. Not a chiclet. That sounded like a chiclet, like those the gum. Oh, gum. Crazy gum. Crazy I'm not talking sense. about the gum. I guess we'll discover whether it is, in fact, a written work of literature or, or a piece of Tencent gum. A piece of Tencent gum sold to you by Mexicans. Yeah. All right. Oh, no. What's that sound? <laughs> no. What it's is the it? sound of a six shooter <clears throat> indicating this, this segment, which I've called the contextual Texan. Oh, no. Because Brandon's from Texas. And at the sound of the six shooter, which you, the audience, just heard, Brandon is going to offer some rootin', tootin', historical, and literary context to today's work. But today's twist is that he can only do it in three sentences. Three sentences. We'll make it five. Do these sentences have any length? Like, no. are there length requirements? No. So they can be like, uh, who was that? Very complex. Sentences. Very complex sentences. Lots right. of modifiers, stuff right. like that. Okay. We'll make it four. Four sentences. Four sentences to set the stage and the context for Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Okay. Historical setting. That's not a first sentence. No, I see the colon after it. Yeah, okay. Historical setting. Britain is at war with France, or potential to go at war with France who just had their revolution. And so this is important for Jane Austen's novel because you have these soldiers who are going from city to city. And this was actually the, a reality throughout Jane Austen's life during this period. So they would move from city to city. That's why you have them at these seaside harbors. So that's sentence one. Sentence, sentence two, hierarchical situation of Britain at the time. You have the landed gentry who want to keep their land. You have this new up-and-coming middle class who want to move into the landed gentry with their money. And so this is actually where Bingley comes from. He's not the landed gentry. Darcy is the landed gentry. Bingley wants to buy land. 
And this is the situation you'll see in a lot of Jane Austen's novels, this tension between the up-and-coming merchant class and then also the landed gentry who all already own their property. And this also has to do with this entailment of Mr. Collins because he is going to receive the land Mr. Bennett already had, and the daughters have no right to that. And that was actually part of Brit British law at the time. So that's part of the historical context, if I only have two sentences to do it. The third sentence should place her in the history of the novel. Um, I feel like I'm not being Texan enough for this. <laughs> should I? <Okay>. Yeah! <laughs> the history of the novel. <laughs> Let's do this. Because we're going to start with a... With a <laughs> With uh, a guy named uh, Don Quixote in 1605. He's often considered to be the first of the uh, novels, and this is important because he was responding to the history of the romance novel up to this point, where it had all been romance and adventure, and Don Quixote introduced parody for this long tradition, and also prose. And this goes all the way up into the 1700s when you have Samuel Richardson write Pamela, which is considered to be one of the first realist novels, but also sentimental. And um, I think a lot of people misunderstand what sentimentalism is. It's this idea that you can help refine the reader's emotions through sentiment, through by showing them the emotions of a character and by eliciting their response. And this, uh, this would provide a context for what Jane Austen would write against with Pride and Prejudice and with her other novels. She would both parody the sentimental tradition, but also write within it. And so you have these romance comedies that are at the same time uh, very realistic, socially real. And so some, a lot of people, last sentence, yeah. this may actually be the fifth sentence, I don't know. Jane Austen is seen as sort of founding um, the social realist novel. And, and who so, came in her wake? Who would come in her wake? A, a lot of the British writers, George Eliot, um, Dickens to an extent, uh, and just a lot of the realist novels, Conrad, and people who would admire her, people who would hate her even borrow from her tradition so and it's funny you have this little this country lady out in the middle of the british countryside kind of changing what british history was and there's other things i could add about um can i add one more sentence one more sentence yes. one more sentence because this is important during her period you had print publications becoming widely available and so i think the best analogy for it would be kind of the blog and amazon culture of today where what happens is if you look at a chart, um, the print publications of novels sort of plateaued and then suddenly spiked towards the end of the 1800s. And this was because suddenly everybody could write novels. And so you had Anne Radcliffe writing her Gothic novels. You had all these pulp fiction become a thing, which Jane Austen read a lot of and also satirized in her novels. And so um, print publication was making it much easier to read novels. And at the beginning of the 1700s, you had these periodicals being produced by guys like Addison and Still with The Spectator that just made it possible for you to put chapters of your book into these periodicals that would then go into the hands of the middle class. And so literature was changing from this courtly um, entertainment to more of a public um, entertainment for everybody. So would Jane Austen have published her novels like would she have had to send it to a publisher who liked it and published it or would she have paid to have had it published or was it basically working the same way that it did now it was different um my understanding would be that she would have friends you know through her family connections and um who would read the books and then get them published her a lot of her novels actually weren't published and popularized until after her death her novels were different in the sense that they weren't the pulp fiction of the time, so they weren't going to be as widely publicized, um, as cheaply available. That was really part of the importance was it being cheaply available. And uh, her books were a little more expensive and more difficult to come by, but they would still be in these circulating libraries and stuff like that. So, what would a really popular would like Radcliffe? Radcliffe, yeah. Radcliffe. She, I mentioned Radcliffe because she makes fun of Radcliffe in um, Northanger North Abbey. Yeah, all the girls are reading. And Radcliffe. And she did, like, the gothic uh, mystery of Udolpho and all yeah, that yeah. Good stuff, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, she would provide the context for, like, Wuthering Heights and stuff that would take her more seriously than Jane Austen did. <laughs> Pride and Prejudice was published in 1813, three years before Jane Austen died. All right, well, I think that ties up our context section, unless you, you know, any more context you were no, just aching to provide. If people really want good context for any author, the best way to do it is to go and read their letters. 
And Jane Austen's letters are widely available. Jane Austen's letters are widely available. Her sister Cassandra burned like uh, three fourths of them. I don't know exactly what the number is, but Cassandra burned a lot of them, which has led to all kinds of speculation and blah, blah, blah. Really, there's not a lot known about Jane Austen's life. There's lots of interesting gaps, including we know she was engaged to a guy and that she wasn't engaged to the guy. And, da, 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 da. and that's all very interesting. And maybe we'll talk about some of that as we go. Oh, my goodness. It's the sound of a, a plane. <laughs> you guys know what that means. It's time for baggage check. <laughs> the to part of the show where we talk about what kind of baggage did you bring to the book? When you first read Pride and Prejudice... Or when you read it this time, what did you expect? What did you think? Jake. I had never read the book growing up. I'd never read anything by Jane Austen. My introduction to the world of Pride and Prejudice and Jane Austen was when I first became a, a Christian. And it, it was all this sort of uh, homeschooled, let's dress up in our, our pretty gowns and mm -hmm. pretend that we are Elizabeth and Jane and... Darcy's going to come save us. And when uh, my uh, my beau proposes to me, we're going to dress up in period costumes and all that sort of like really gross, disgusting. I don't even know what to say about it. Well, we all grew up in the late 80s, early 90s. There was a big kind of homeschooling movement. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with homeschooling, all you, since you guys are our audience, probably. <laughs> but uh, just saying, there's certain cultural Christian yeah. conservative things that go along with that. Civil well, so War here balls. I am, then a yeah. college pastor, right? And you've uh, you've got these girls that think, you know, they want to live the fantasy of a Jane Austen novel, and but it's not really the fantasy of a Jane Austen novel. It's the Kiera Knightley and what's his face version of Pride and Prejudice, which I had seen. The only context I had was seeing that version of Pride and Prejudice. And so I understood it to be this sort of windswept romance guy mm -hmm. comes and sweeps you off your feet and it's perfect. And then you end up sitting, looking at the lake, talking about being Mrs. Darcy and call me divine goddess on Tuesdays or whatever it is. And and so I, I just wanted to destroy that kind of mentality, that way of thinking about relationships. And so I would just tell people, Darcy doesn't exist. And you weren't just being a jerk. You were a college pastor at this time that actually had to deal with actual Yeah, I was just trying to bring girls down mm -hmm. to earth, you know, and say, hey, you know, this fantasy, it's, it's not real. It doesn't exist. You need to get over it and you need to get over yourself. And then you read the book, I guess, post-2005 because that's when Kara Knightley's version came out. Ugh. Yeah, I read it. I read it maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago. I was in the middle of teaching a series on relationships to the college group, and you had pushed me uh, to read it, and so I did. And what I realized in the process was not that the relationship between Elizabeth and Darcy is, you know, a fantastical thing I needed to fight against, but that what I really had were a bunch of Lydias and Wickhams, mm -hmm. and uh, who who fancied themselves to be. Elizabeth and Darcy. Yeah, yeah. I think I kind of had a similar uh, awakening to Jane Austen. I always assumed, I think I probably saw a movie version of Pride and Prejudice. I don't know actually whether I saw the BBC uh, Colin Firth version first or read the book first, but I always kind of thought of it as a chick thing, as a proto-feminist kind of a thing, because that's how you hear about it a lot. And yeah, as more of a, I imagined it as more of a Wuthering Heights or a Jane Eyre kind of a girl thing. And I don't remember why I read it. I think I must have read it for school, but I really enjoyed it, and I didn't know why. I read it a lot younger than you did. I was probably 13 or 14, but I really got into it. It moved me, and it had a lot of truth. And um, then it took me many years to kind of piece together what it is I actually like about Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. Brandon? I read her, I read Pride and Prejudice probably around the same age you did. I came in from having read a lot of Dickens, so the whole sentimental tradition, and I was very fond of Dickens, which I'm sure will provide some interesting <laughs> conversations later on. But um, So I read her after that, and then also after reading Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, so I liked the windswept, emotional... Um, were you disappointed that Pride and Prejudice didn't actually have more windswept emotional? I was disappointed that it wasn't as big or seem as big as those other novels at that time. Then I didn't really read her again until 
probably graduate school. And at that time, I approached her thinking that she was, like you said, this proto-feminist. Because you have Susan Gubar, or whatever her name is, who taught here for a while. She wrote this book called The Mad Woman in the Attic. And one of her chapters is on Jane Austen. And I read Jane Austen expecting her to be what Gubar said, because I wanted to trust these professors only to find out that they have a complete inability to read anything outside of what they want it to seem. And so they'll have these preconceived notions of feminist liberalism. And so they go right in and they read her as they want to read her and completely miss Darcy and Bingley and uh, Mr. Bennett and the realities of the men and the social commentary that Austin's making about women. And they just get it completely wrong. I think the two things that everybody kind of says, and um, during baggage check, we're also allowed to talk about cultural baggage that everybody brings. Yeah. And I think two things that I always just assumed without even thinking about it were what Jane Austen was all about was a proto-feminism. You know, the idea that Jane Austen couldn't quite be a feminism because they hadn't quite invented it, even though I guess, uh, you know, Mary... Vulcan, Strothel, whatever was around back then. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, Jane Austen couldn't quite be a feminist, but she could, within the confines of her class and her situation, be as feminist as she possibly could, and we could read back and find all kinds of interesting feminist things. The other thing was the whole social angle, the whole class, the whole this is what people have to do for money. And indeed, if you look at it, the back of any Jane Austen, it'll it'll say something. I don't know. What is the back of... What does it say? Da-da-da-da-da, blah-blah. Then this love story of Elizabeth and Darcy misjudge. Then they challenge and change each other. It's also a novel about the search for happiness and self-knowledge in a world of strict social rules where a woman must marry well to survive. <laughs> Man. Where a woman must marry well to survive. This survive. person got published on the back of Penguin Classics, <laughs> so you know they must be right. That is the back of Penguin Classics. Please don't sue us, Penguin Classics. That is the back of your book... <laughs> I don't think they're going to see us. If Penguin Classics <laughs> listens to this, that's probably that would be awesome. If Penguin Classics came after us, I would be very proud. But um, <laughs> so bring it, Penguin Classics. If you're listening to this, bring it. We've got a six shooter and airplanes. We've got a six shooter and airplanes, as you've heard in the sound effects <laughs> that actually did happen in the studio today. Um, anyway, yeah, I always thought Pride and Prejudice was about class distinction and overcoming class distinction. So what you guys think about reading Pride and Prejudice? This was my second time reading it all the way through. I've read bits and pieces, and, you know, I'm familiar with it, and I've seen the movies, and da 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 da, da. I think you guys have both read it at least more than once. So this time around, we all just read it for this very special podcast. What would you, you guys think? Uh, what struck me most was how brilliant she is at sketching characters. Um, even... The characters that I remembered as being more parodic than they, like Mr. Um, Collins or Mrs. Bennett, had much more reality to them this time around. Mm-hmm. I identified with Mr. Collins and was more than I was comfortable with, which speaks a lot to what she's able to do with dialogue and with mannerisms. And Yeah, I think I mean, you can see that come through. I watched the BBC version for the first time uh, and got to see different takes on characters comparing it to the, what was it, the 2005 mm-hmm. version? Karen Knightley. Very different takes on a couple of different characters. And you, I realized just how good the characters she developed were that they mm-hmm. admitted of such different performances. I agree. Jake, did you have any sp- particular thing that you walked away with this reading? Um, no, I think just more. The, the first time I read it, I was very taken and um, had strong opinions about everything. And. Uh, the second time I was able maybe to appreciate more of the craft of just noticing little things like the way she set up the relationship with Lydia and Kitty, where Lydia will start talking a certain way. And then a couple chapters later, Kitty will be mm-hmm. mimicking uh, the way that, that Lydia talks or those sorts of things. The, the very unique way of speaking that different characters have. Yeah, well, age, I think, adds a lot to it as well. Mm. You see Kitty and then you realize where she comes from is the failure of her parents Mm -hmm. to provide. And then there's a little bit of hope at the end with Kitty. So there's some wisdom that I missed first time around that's there. And you realize that Austin paid a lot of attention to her family. 
Mm-hmm. So you, you know, people don't want to bring the biography of the author into a reading, but I think it's helpful. Mm-hmm. And you must imagine that she had these things happen. She saw them, and she was good at socially observing things and then putting them into a novel. Mm-hmm. She was good at socially observing things <laughs> and putting them into a novel. That's our tagline. <laughs> <laughs> the socially observing. Wow. So uh, Jane Austen biography real quick, since Brandon thinks it might be helpful. Jane Austen's father was a pastor, rector, whatever they called him, some kind of British preaching guy who preached for money. <laughs> I mean, not like in a bad way, but like Jake does, you know. <laughs> and uh, her mother was her mother, had Jane, had a bunch of kids. It was real good. Uh, she had a big family. Thank lots you, of. Often caveats. What's? Nothing. Go ahead. Lots of brothers. I'm just. Sniping okay. very low. Note to self, edit out snide comments by Jake Menzel. Okay. She had lots of older brothers, big family. I don't know. I'm just trying to hit the one big her, things. One of her brothers was a soldier. One of her brothers thought, was a soldier. I thought there were like three of them that went into the Navy and yeah. three of them that went into the ministry or something like that. Yes, there's at least one I know that went into the ministry, one that became an admiral later on and lived to be 82. Uh, she, she would have been very – her family would be similar to the Bennetts in their standing socially, mm-hmm. which was important because they, you know, they had some money, some land, but they weren't the Bingleys and they weren't, they certainly weren't the Darcys. But she moved enough in the Bingley Darcy circles to know what she was talking about. Yeah. It's not all fantasy wish fulfillment. She, mm-hmm. she had been, she went to galleries in London. I was reading one of her letters where she talks about looking for portraits. She's trying to find a portrait of Jane and of not of herself, but of the character Jane Bennett and of the character Elizabeth Darcy, I guess as she was called. I sure hope that if you hear any tribal drums, <laughs> we're actually recording this from the middle of Africa right now. We're in a big pot. It's a very stereotypical 1940s type cartoon Africa. Um, and we're about to get eaten. And we thought the best thing to do would be to record a po- podcast about Pride and Prejudice. So, Mark Twain said he would like to dig up Jane Austen and beat her over the skull with her own shin bone. Do you guys feel that that's a valid form of literary criticism? (laughs) A valid form of literary criticism, yes. Yes, I do think that's a valid form. If you could dig up one person and beat them over the head with their own shin bone, who would it be? Mark Twain. Mark Twain. Oh, (laughs) Oh, man. Sing. Let the shin boner be shinned. Uh, I think it might be a tie between Twain and Dickens, actually. J- Dick- oh, Jake hates there Dickens. We go. Shots yeah, fired. Here, here. <laughs> when Jake All dies, right. Brandon <laughs> will dig him up <laughs> and beat him it'll over be, the head with his own shin bone. Uh, it's, uh, j- d- I think Mark Twain was probably just being a jerk because Mark Twain was an old guy that just liked to be a jerk by this time. Always a jerk. But yeah. uh, he also said that the characters, the word that he used was. I don't know. I was going to find the exact word that he said so you podcast listeners would be impressed with me, but I think he said her characters were disgusting or something like that. He said she never liked any of her characters. And that is a thing that Jake wants to say something about. (laughs) Mark Twain said that she never liked any of her characters? Basically. I mean, he expressed that sentiment. I don't know if he used those words. Yeah, that's the idea that he was getting across in wherever that quote comes from. The Shinbone quote, yeah. It's from a letter of his to uh, somebody. Yeah. There's only one character of Mark Twain's that he ever liked, and that was Huck. Yeah. That's the thing that shines through in everything that Mark Twain ever wrote, is he just hates everybody. He's always making fun of everybody. Yeah. And you can get that feeling from Jane. Um, I think that every author, um, especially if they're a classic author, they're going to err on one of two sides, but what they what they really bring together in their work is perception into human nature ability to see and understand people and then and then with that hopefully compassion uh, mm-hmm. for for their characters a love for their characters a love for people and for humanity and um any, any great author is going to going to going to err on one side or the other um different authors fall somewhere along the spectrum i think jane hits pretty close to the middle i uh, my first um, impression the first time I read Pride and Prejudice was that she didn't have much compassion for her characters. But first impressions, as we know, <laughs> eventually become Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but but this second time, I you know we we'd gone around about that. Right, um, it's something we've talked about a lot off mic. 
Yeah, and so I was looking, questioning my that judgment as I read, and I th- I think that they're, I think she actually comes off as more brutal than Twain because she cares more, mm. you know, in, in so far as she has a real moral sense and a moral center, it's hard for her to forgive Mrs. Bennett for being as awful as she is. Whereas Twain would just make fun of her since Twain star comparison, Twain would just make fun of her and be done with it. No, Jane judges, but Jane does judge. Yeah. And I think we live in a pretty pansy age and we don't like that. Yeah. Twain has, his satire is so far reaching that it doesn't discern between people. Everybody falls. He's more like Tom Swift. Or, who am I thinking? Jonathan Swift. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, everybody is going to be made fun of. But when you do that, there, you might be able to make big points about society, but you're not going to make the small points that matter as much as Jane Austen makes. And so, just having a scene where she has Collins out gardening. There's some mm-hmm. sympathy for Collins there. Mm-hmm. There really is. Yeah, and in those scenes, one thing I took away was Jane Austen was making just as much a comment about Elizabeth as she was Collins. When Elizabeth goes to her house and she thinks that she's she knows Charlotte and mm-hmm. she's figured Charlotte out, she, that's what Elizabeth always thinks is that she has everyone figured out. You know, she's only, what, 20? 20, exactly. Yeah, and it comes, back, it comes I mean, back to bite her. And, and, <clears throat> and in contrast to that, you have you have Jane, and maybe we want to co- come at this later. Jane, um, the character, not Jane Austen, she's just all all good natured compassion for people. But mm-hmm. let's let's talk about these these characters. I guess I guess Jane Austen was pretty good at writing characters, huh? Characters. Yeah, <laughs> she was. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just I, I thought it might be fun since uh, this book is famous for its wonderful characters, and that's the big draw to just go through them a little bit. So Elizabeth Bennet, let's just talk about Elizabeth Bennet. Obviously, a lot of people use her for girl power. Girl spelled G U R L. She is one of those characters in literature that is often cited as a proto feminist type. So. Let's talk about that. What do you guys think about Elizabeth Bennet as a character, as a creation, as a... Where do you want to start, Jake? You know, you hear people say that um, Elizabeth is maybe the one character in all of Austen's literature that she puts herself most into. At least I think I've read that somewhere recently. (laughs) Elizabeth was the least dear to Mrs. Bennet of all her children. I think that... And the most dear to her father. And the most dear to her father. Yeah, I think she's probably the closest to Jane's heart, though Jane gave her older sister her name. So I think that there's more satire and more bitingness with Elizabeth than people want to say there is. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think that the Elizabeth at the beginning of the novel, I mean, come on, she falls prey to Wickham. She's just as naive yeah. as Lydia. And any right? re- the reader doesn't even yeah. fall prey for Wickham generally. So you, you could easily say that Pride and Prejudice is Elizabeth. She's both Pride and she's Prejudice, right? Yeah, that's right. She's there's there's no real sympathy for her until finally at the end of the novel she comes to realize that these um, expectations in society that what Charlotte did wasn't idiotic, right? There was some. Yeah. Well, and again, the, the thing that I always think about Elizabeth is I, I try to think, would I actually like this chick if I met her? And the answer is probably not. Yeah. I mean, she's one of those chicks that you like or one of those people. Yeah, like uh, Lewis says when he's talking about um, C.S. Lewis, for those of you <laughs> not smart <laughs> enough to know who I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, in talking about Paradise Lost, says everyone always says Satan is the greatest character, but you have to realize if you hung out for five minutes with this guy, you would be disgusted by him. Yeah. He's totally self-pitying, blah, blah, blah. And so I think the, met, the that's one of those uh, metrics that I always use to judge is, would I like hanging out with this person? And I've known a lot of people that are like Elizabeth Bennett, and they have attractive qualities. They're smart. They're feisty but i've also known the stereotypical girl who grew up reading pride and prejudice and does is 20 years old and does judge anybody everybody and it's pretty obnoxious and when i was 20 i thought it was obnoxious even though i was exactly the same way and didn't know it 
And now that I'm a little bit older than that, I still find it obnoxious, you know, and I have a lot of sympathy for her. I was her in some ways. I am her in some ways. And that's why she's sympathetic. That's why everybody loves her. But she's not necessarily someone. I mean, you could imagine going to a party and you say something and she stomps all over it. You you try to be polite. She has a sarcastic comment. It's not necessarily. I don't know that that's true. I think it I think it depends on. So she's good humored. That's Elizabeth's best quality is that she's 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 a good humored girl, and she tries to find something funny or something happy in about everything she runs into. Yeah, some way of spinning even the most awful things that happen, so she can at least at least laugh at it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that while it can be nasty, I think it can also be a very sympathetic thing and. There are a couple the, times, the though, where of, Darcy comes and he's obviously being nice and she doesn't really have anything against him besides the one snide comment he made. And politeness would at least dictate that she doesn't just come at him with a sarcastic zinger. But she and does, she does. Least. And it's it's like, <clears throat> if that really happened to you, if you really saw that happen, it's bad behavior. You wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't be happy to be in the room. You'd be embarrassed for her in the yeah, same way that she is embarrassed for her mother and her sister. That's true. I, I, I think that there are... Um, I'm not saying she's unattractive. She is, and probably I'd marry her. In well, there's life, a reason but. she stands out to Darcy, right? There's a reason that she stands out, that she and Jane are both set apart in everybody's eyes as somebody they'd like to spend time with as opposed to the rest of the family. And it's not because she's as all, all as obnoxious as your maybe painting her to be i i imagine elizabeth as being somebody who's uh good humored and fun uh the kind of the kind of uh woman i i'd want to be friends with i might want to kind of share a a joke out of the corner of my eye with maybe not the kind of woman i'd want to end up marrying you know but um that would be polygamy right as i'm already married (laughs) polygamy Yeah, I'm not trying. I'm sorry. I probably overpainted her as obnoxious. I don't think she ultimately is horrible. I'm just trying to say they're first. Well, I just want to say in, in comparison to the characters that she's around, or at least your perception as a reader, I don't think you you tend to feel that way as you go, though. No, but that's because you're... Because she said in contrast to what, Caroline Bingley? Yeah. Right, and you're seeing it. Yeah, and she is better. She is ultimately deserving of the happiness that she gets. I'm just trying to say she's not perfect, and if you had to spend time with her, you'd find real flaws that don't necessarily stand out if you're a 15-year-old girl In other girl words, the she's a realistic character. Yeah, yeah. and those she's flaws are character. they're more pronounced early in the novel. They're still there later in the novel. And that's because this is in the tradition of the Buildings Roman or the Buildings Roman, which is the coming-of-age uh, novel. And so she starts out and where pe- here's this, I'm going to read something from the introduction of this. Um, classics. Elizabeth Bennett seems to connect most directly with the active, visible, independent identity of modern femininity. Which maybe that's true in the early part of the novel, where she feels free to make fun of this person who would have been very well respected at the time, and she um, wants to easily listen to Wickham and just believe what he says. You know, and She thinks this is independence of mind, but actually later on, it's when she becomes willing to... Um, here's a quote directly from the book that this feminist who wrote this introduction took issue with. I'll just read. It was a union that must have been to the advantage of both. So this is when she's thinking about finally saying yes to Darcy. By her ease and liveliness, his mind might have been softened. His manners improved, and from his judgment, information, and knowledge of the world, she must have received benefit of greater importance. So it's when she finally realizes that she could receive benefit of greater importance from someone else, that maybe there's someone who could benefit her more than she could benefit other people by mm. laughing at them, which is, obvi- I mean, she sees that as a virtue of hers, but it goes too far. Her pride is too severe. And, of course, this, uh, the feminist who wrote this Doesn't introduction wait. hates this. She, why, did they, why did she have to put in here? It's unfortunate. Well, it's, I think- it's a sign of her time that she had to put in, that Jane Austen wrote it would be of greater importance Obviously, this is just part of the patriarchal system, and if it was written a century later, that wouldn't be there, but I don't think that's true. Right. Well, that's what the feminists always say about these books specifically, is there's Jane Austen being as feminist as she can, and then any time there's anything that they don't like, it's, oh, there's oh she had to do that because the patriarch made her end the book that way. 
So Jane Bennett, obviously kind of a boring character in some ways, I guess. Anybody want to argue with that? Well, she's interesting in uh, that, at least from Elizabeth's perspective, she's perfect. Mm-hmm. And, and yet also foolish or seemingly foolish. Yeah. With Jane, I think that I made the point that you argued against that she's the least realistic. She and who else did I say? Bingham. Not on this podcast, but outside the podcast and the world that exists outside the podcast. <laughs> but <clears throat> I think that what she's doing partly is making fun of this sentimental tradition. Mm-hmm. Jane gets sick and she can't leave because she got wet. Right. And I, that was this trope at the time of the women get sick when they get wet and um, they're weak and they're sickly. And she has to stay with Bingley. Um, Jane's also very sentimental. She's more likely to side with someone based on her feelings, right? And so I think she is making fun of that partly, but she does sympathize with Jane too. And I think that there's some there's some drive in the novel by Jane Austen to say that Elizabeth should be a little bit more like Jane. Yeah, I really think that I was talking to one, one such homeschooled, grow up, grew up loving Jane Austen a girl not too long ago, and she said she always had the question in her mind, should I aspire to be more like Elizabeth or Jane? And mm-hmm. it, at that point, I don't think it had ever occurred to me that Jane Austen would, was setting anybody forward except for Elizabeth. But the more I began to think about it, I think Austen's sympathy for Jane shows up in Jane being constantly vindicated for her good-natured, hopeful, just just er, her earnest uh, compassion for people, her earnest willingness to think the best of everybody. It does make her more vulnerable, mm-hmm. but but Austen, as the as the god of this universe is protecting Jane. But she's also willing to discipline Jane enough oh, yeah. to admit that her very perfection is a problem and her demureness. And I think like the fact that uh, Wickham, the Wickhams are able to just mooch off of them is a, a failing. And the fact that, you know, I think Jane has enough moral sense and good sense about her characters to realize that there are very real dangers that Bingley, the Bingleys will fall into as a couple yeah. just yeah. based on their perfections. The good, their good heartedness brings with it its own sins and temptations. But yeah, I Mr. think she Bennett. shows that it also yeah. brings its protections too. Yeah. That uh, there's a God in, in Jane Austen's universe that protects them. And I don't think there's any other way to think about it but that, you know, they're free hearted, they're generous toward everybody, not just in yeah. in money, but in, in sentiment. And it comes back to them one way or another, and it doesn't end up burning them the way that a more cynical author would would have them be burned. Yeah, what is that that Mr. Bennett says about them? You'll never have any money, but you'll be happy or something like that, right? Yeah, you'll overspend. Yeah. That's basically what Jake said. Yeah, but they'll be be happy. And so, yeah, I think he's right. Jane Austen is protecting them and holding them up as just as exemplary. So here's here's the question. As... As people, dudes who have reproduced and produced little females, yeah. who would you tell your daughter to emulate? Gun to your head, got to choose one. You're going to go to a desert island and learn from Elizabeth Bennett, or you're going to go to a desert island and learn from Jane, and then you're going to come back when you're 18 and your f- character is fully formed by one of these two. Or do we have to go with a combination? Gun, no, gun to my head, Elizabeth. And the reason is because... Um, Elizabeth would, while she might be impatient, and while she might want to make fun, she'd had. I think she would have gained and had the wisdom to to teach my daughter discernment and to teach. And she has enough admiration for Jane mm-hmm. that she, and em- enough at least by the end of the novel, disdain for her own pride and her own prejudice yeah. to want to cultivate more Jane like. I think as long as we live in a universe where Jane Austen is God, that's fine. Your Jane Austen is God thing makes it kind of interesting because if you live in a universe where she's not God and where these moral forces aren't working to work things out the way that they do, the Elizabeth at the beginning of the novel doesn't necessarily turn out okay and isn't necessarily someone to be envied or... Yeah, I mean, to. is that what? Which Elizabeth are you talking about? You have the Elizabeth at the, the beginning, who I would not want my daughter to well, be I taught by. I, see, I don't know because I, isn't the virtue of an author the the ability 
not only to perceive character, but to perceive the world as it is, as it's governed by the one true God of the universe. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that, that Austin's wrong in how she pulls together these outcomes. I think God's often that kind and gracious. It's a Boaz story. It's a, that's right. But God sometimes isn't. You know what I mean? Like yeah, some some, some women don't have the the for, the things happen to them yeah. that cause them to mature. Uh, yeah. And one of these days we'll get to Mansfield Park, which will be very interesting because Jane Austen does seem like a much crueler god of that universe, and she punishes the Elizabeth Bennet of mm-hmm. that universe in a pretty interesting way. Hmm. Um, so anyway, we'll talk. Well, about I that. think that that's but... a good thing about about the universe that she's created of her books. But I think that. You have to allow that that sort of thing does happen. In Pride and Prejudice. It does, yeah. And um, maybe the least realistic thing in the whole book to me is how Elizabeth actually manages to change Darcy. He humbles Darcy, and he actually changes a real qualitative change in his mm-hmm. character. And that's, a, that's pr- maybe the most dangerous th- part of the book. I think there's a little woman. bit of... A little bit of wish fulfillment. Well, let's talk about Darcy in general. He is Bruce Wayne, basically. Yeah. He's a millionaire. He's got a secret thing that he does that, you know, saves everybody. And um, he's awesome. Yeah. So is Darcy a fantasy figure? Should our, should your daughters be out there looking for their Darcy? Obviously, if that means a certain kind of thing, we know the answer is no. But if it actually means the character in the novel. Hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think um, maybe not the, the rich billionaire. Right. But but what you have in Darcy is a man who is he is flawed. Uh, what is what is Lizzie say? Is it to Jane? About Wickham and Wickham versus Darcy, one has all the appearance all, of all, 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 one is yeah. truly good; the other has all the appearance of goodness. And it's a shame that you know it's the opposite. He doesn't have the appearance of goodness, but he's a good man. He's an honorable man, and he, you know, he sets his affection on Elizabeth, and then he doesn't care what anybody thinks. He lays down his reputation. He lays down his money. He puts it all on the line. Yeah. Um, and those are honorable qualities. And yeah, maybe it's sort of a dream, but you see it, you know, it's Boaz and, and it's Jesus, right? You know, Boaz is a, a comfortable man, a wealthy man. And this stranger Moabitess shows up in his fields and he takes care of her. It's such a sweet, sweet story. And uh, that those aspects of Darcy... They can exist in men, and they do exist in godly men, and that's absolutely something that our daughters should strive to find. I do think it is often the case that, as it is in the story, that the the men with the appearance of goodness are are false, and the guys that really are, they don't come across that way. Um, they come across as gruff or mm-hmm. distant to these women who have these romantic ideals when they're young. That's right, they and that's that's yeah. exactly why I said earlier, you know, yeah, I used to always just tell girls Darcy doesn't exist yeah. because he's perfect in every way, and yeah. Yeah, that was my perception. He's this perfect guy in every way. He's going to come and sweep you off your feet. He's going to be beautiful. He's going to be handsome. He's going to be charming. He's going to be rich, and he's going to sacrifice for you, and it's just going to be awesome. Well, and stop that. Yeah, Come down to earth and learn what it is you should be actually looking for in a man. Well, what Austin does that's so great is she blows up the windswept. Yep. Wickham, you know, is a monster. And Elizabeth was, even Elizabeth was taken in. Yep. And what every every young woman needs to constantly be asking herself is, am I Lydia? And is this man Wickham? Yeah, yeah. That's right. I think the important thing is, yes, our daughter should aspire to Dar- for Darcy as he is in this novel because it's really important to keep in mind that this novel is written from the perspective of Elizabeth right and so everything that happens is from her perspective and so one of the turning points is when she finds out right in the middle of the novel that Wickham was a liar and that Darcy was not a liar and that the thing to warn your daughter about and why Elizabeth because I don't think I ever answered your first question why Elizabeth would be a good tutor for my daughter 
is because Elizabeth comes to realize that Wickham's exist, right? Mm -hmm. And she can warn young ladies about that, that Wickham's exist, that Lydia exists, why Lydia exists. And she understands all of the things that she was blinded to, the things that she was willfully blind to that allowed her to fall for Wickham, right? She looks back and all of a sudden it's obvious. Wickham says things like, you know, I would never speak ill of him publicly, you know, for love of Mr. Darcy, yeah. who, who died, who loved me so much. And then as soon as Darcy leaves town, he's just jabbering to everybody about how Darcy had done him wrong. Yeah. And Elizabeth does have the discernment to see those kinds of things. She was willfully blind, I yep. think. She wanted Darcy to be as bad as Wickham made him out to be. She wanted to believe the lies. She wanted Wickham to be charming. She wanted the attention of the guy who'd been done wrong by Darcy, just like she had been done wrong by Darcy by his one stupid comment. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and that, that's a powerful moment in the novel when she realizes all the things that Wickham had done that she should have realized. Mm-hmm. Her lack of discernment and seeing that as soon as Darcy left, he did start gossiping. Everybody knew how bad Darcy mm-hmm. was. And it was all because of Wickham. Right? And she realizes, man... Her own thoughts of her brilliant ability to read people were just they were, it was garbage. Completely blinded by yeah. her, by her, dare I say, pride and prejudice. Today's episode of The Booketing was written and produced by me, Nathan Alberson. It was performed by Nathan Alberson, Brandon Chastine, and Jacob Menzel. But wait, I can almost hear you saying, is that everything you guys have to say about Pride and Prejudice? The answer is no. No, we have way more to say about Pride and Prejudice. We haven't even scratched the surface. Well, I, I hope we've scratched the surface. But the point is, we have a lot more to say about it in part two of our discussion about Pride and Prejudice coming next week. And if you want to read ahead, you should know that coming next month, we will be reading John Steinbeck's East of Eden.